Hello and welcome to our video summarising everything you need to know about the Songs of Ourselves Volume 1 Part 2 Anthology. My name is Barbara and this is the 15th and final of our 15 part video series where we examine all poems within the Songs of Ourselves Volume 1 Part 2 Anthology. If you want to see the other videos, make sure you check out our channel and look through all other 14 videos which will be available for you to read, analyse and walk through when it comes to analysing each poem within this collection. So let's finish off with the final poem in this collection which is The Kraken by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Now this poem is a 15 line variant of an Italian or Petrarchan sonnet. This poem can be divided into just these two sections that can then be divided further. The Kraken is made up of one octave, in other words a set of eight lines, which can be divided into two sets of four lines and one final set of seven lines. This poem does follow a consistent rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, E, F, E, G, G, F, E. Now the Kraken describes the slumbering bulk of this creature, its eventual rise to the surface of the sea resulting in death and it's a really apocalyptic image that's used within the poem. Now this poem begins with the speaker describing how deeply one would have to look in the ocean to find the kraken. It's in a place that no human can truly go. He continues on to state that the kraken is not the king of this place but just another feature however it's an enduring feature of this part of the ocean. This is due to the fact that the kraken has been sleeping an ancient sleep. It's become home or rather the kraken has become home for all of the creatures of the deep and in the final lines of the poem it's revealed that eventually the kraken will wake up and it will bring all of its power to man and angels alike and then die when it reaches the surface. Now, when we look at lines one to four, the poem starts with the speaker describing a portion of the sea that's far from the reach or full understanding of humankind. He describes a place that's unfathomable to the human eye and can only be described in the grandest of terms. The speaker then lays out the details of the habitat of the kraken and the life it lives. The place that this kraken resides in is located below or under the layer of the upper deep. So this is really the deepest, deepest parts of the sea. The portion of the sea that's accessible to us that is referred to as the upper section is only the start. There's so much more to come. And this, as the speaker takes the reader deeper and deeper into the ocean, he passes this abysmal sea. The kraken doesn't reside anywhere close to the surface. In fact, he's far, far beneath all of these layers of the ocean. Once the speaker has taken his readers down through the ocean, he comes upon the kraken. And this kraken is in a deep sleep. It's in a state, this is a state rather, that he's inhabited for an innumerable swath of years. His sleep is, and to quote from the poem, ancient, dreamless and uninvaded. Now we as readers might get the feeling now that the speaker has taken the narrative to this place that the sleep might be coming to an end. We appear perhaps maybe to be invading the Kraken's realm. And in the final line of this section, the speaker starts his description of what this place is and the beast that's within it. Now, when we look at lines five to eight, we get a greater understanding of this world, which is so deep below. We're taken to a place that no human has ever been or will ever go. In the realm of the Kraken, there's no sun. He is much too deep below the waves for the sun to touch him. Now, the next lines in this section emphasise the extended period of time that this beast has been sleeping. He's remained there in the same spot for so long that its millennia of growth surround him. There are huge sponges and sea plants from every form of swell which are all around him and the kraken is so deep within the ocean that there's only sickly light about him. In other words, there's only a very tiny, small sliver of light. It's also in the mega lighting that life has made its home. The Kraken has slept for so long in the same place that creatures of the sea have come to live in its wondrous grot, which is a shortened form of grotto, and within the unnumbered and secret parts of its body. This Kraken's mass is becoming nothing more than another part of the ocean on which other creatures have made their home. Now in lines 9 to 15, there's a change that's predicted in the realm of the Kraken. 
Now, this section states the speaker is emphasizing that the beast has resided in this place for an endless number of days and there's enormous polypi or growths that winnow or cover its giant arms. Now, one might imagine that this kraken is covered with perhaps a green layer of small green growths. The speaker also describes into quote, there hath he lain for ages. The speaker then goes on further to state that the kraken will continue to lie, battening upon huge sea worms whilst he sleeps, at least for a while longer. Now, the final three lines of this poem give a hint of what will happen when the time comes for the kraken to wake up. This will only happen when, to quote from the poem, the latter fire shall heat the deep. The kraken will wake up and be driven up from the ocean floor, either by necessity or by a newly reinvigorated passion. He will, to quote, once by man and by the angels be seen again. However, the world in its entirety will see the beast and know its greatness. However, we get the sense that it's almost this apocalyptic occasion that might happen, which could also result in the end of the world. Now, this one act of power and assertion as a kraken surfaces from the depths of the ocean will come crashing down as, and to quote from the poem, roaring he shall rise and on the surface die. Now, this entire poem can be interpreted as a metaphor for any type of impassioned revolution. The kraken can be seen as a contingent of people who have perhaps a harboured hatred or discontentment or oppressed fear that finally reaches a breaking point and then there's a pure unencumbered emotion that comes roaring to the surface but when it reaches the clear air it then dies. So even the best intentions can fall short when they are met with the challenges of reality and that's one way you can interpret the meaning of this poem. So that's all. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a big thumbs up, but also consider subscribing to this channel. Also, make sure you visit our website, www.firstreetutors.com. There you will find a wealth of model answers, essays, as well as online courses, which you can take in a very short period of time to improve your knowledge of both this anthology, but also other areas of English, especially if you're doing this in very short timed conditions. Thank you so much for listening and make sure you check out our other 14 videos which look at other poems with this anthology.